Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. In a previous lecture, we learned how to create a voltage-controlled oscillator that produces sawtooth waveforms. And in another lecture, we saw how to turn the sawtooth into a triangle wave. And in this lecture, we'll see how to take that sawtooth wave and turn it into a pulse wave, also known as a rectangular wave. For the past six years, I've had the honor of being one of the judges at the Moog Hackathon at Georgia Tech, which is associated with the Guthman Musical Instrument Competition. The hackathon is themed around the Moog Werkstatt, and every team is given a Werkstatt. Moog Music has done a fantastic job in making the Werkstatt amenable to hacking. Now, in the documentation, they have this line that basically says they don't recommend hacking the Werkstatt. And of course, if you break your Werkstatt while trying to modify it, that will totally void your warranty. So if you do bust your Werkstatt, don't go complaining at Moog. That said, it is really a great platform for experimenting with modifying hardware. And I'll generally suggest that you pick one of these up. The Werkstatt brings in 12 volts DC and regulates that down to 9 volts and 5 volts. And with the help of a boost buck converter, also creates minus 9 volts. One quirk of the Werkstatt is that its VCO outputs, both its sawtooth and its pulse outputs, produce waveforms that aren't centered around DC. They go from 0 volts to 5 volts. The pulse generating circuitry I'm about to show you is built around a 393 comparator, which is powered between 9 volts and ground. Keep those numbers in mind. So here's the pulse generating wave shaper in the Werkstatt. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that the sawtooth VCO in the Werkstatt works opposite of the way the design and how Chamberlain's book does. In that design, we reset to zero volts and then ramp up to five volts, at which point we trip over a threshold and reset. I'm pretty sure that the Werkstatt works the opposite and it resets to five volts and lowers the voltage until it hits a threshold. I'm not 100% sure on that, so don't quote me on that, but it's not gonna really matter for the analysis we wanna do here anyway. So the LM393 is very much like the LM311 that we looked at in a previous lecture. Like the LM311, this has a special open collector output. So basically, when the output is a logical true, the output is entirely disconnected from the rest of the universe. And then the pulse output is pretty much going to be this 5 volt that we see here through this 4.99K pull-up resistor. For a pull-up resistor, it seems a little crazy to use a 1% resistor, which a 4.99K is. But if you're buying resistors in bulk, why not go ahead and use a 4.99K resistor? That's just a guess. Now, if the output of the comparator is a logical false, what the circuit will do is it will take the output and it will hook it to whatever the negative supply voltage is, which in this case is ground. So what we wind up with at the output is a pulse that goes between zero volts and five volts. And as I mentioned before, that's just what the Werkstatt does. It doesn't have any other circuitry to center this or scale it beyond that. And notice that it is indeed important to have this pull-up resistor here. Otherwise, the 393 would be trying to short 5 volts to ground, and that would not make it very happy. And the coolest thing is that by changing the voltage that we're comparing the incoming signal to, we can change what this pulse width is. So we can have a nice square wave, or we can have something that has more like a 25% duty cycle, roughly speaking. I'm not drawing this very well. Anyway, you get the idea. All of these will have different sorts of sound. And if we have something with a very narrow pulse in EC3084 signals and systems, we would say this would be something close to an approximation of an impulse train. Although an impulse train has pulses that are kind of sort of infinitely high, but not really. Anyway, that's more complicated than we need to get into right now. The closer you get to one of these really narrow waves, the more you get kind of a nasal sound that would be the start of like a harpsichord sound. Now, one thing that winds up happening with these very narrow pulses is that the sound can also become very quiet. So just be aware of that. Remember that the positive supply here was set at 9 volts. And we really need to do that in order for the chip to understand how to compare these inputs for things up to 5 volts.
you probably need the upper supply to be somewhere around a couple of volts, I'm guessing, of whatever the maximum voltage you might be putting at the inputs here are. In this case, you couldn't just run the positive supply here off of 5 volts because there would be a point where it was trying to compare voltages up here and it wouldn't really know what to do with that. Okay, so now let's take a look at the PWMCV input here. Notice that if we were to set this to ground, I would have a voltage divider that would put 2.5 volts here, and that would give us a square wave, basically. That would give us a 50% duty cycle. On the other hand, if I put a 5 volt here, that would basically be averaging with this 5 volts. So I would have 5 volts, and I would have a very narrow pulse sort of at one end of the waveform. But if I were to put a minus 5 volts here, then this voltage divider setup would give me 0 volts here, and that would be a very narrow pulse on the other end. So I think the PWMCV here is basically designed to run between minus 5 to 5 volts as sort of a useful range that will give you meaningful sonic differences. So let's look at another design. This is Ivusan, who's published a lot of designs under the name Usynth. Let's go check out some of his projects. And this is an old synthesizer that he built. Let's look at his latest work. Let's see what we have here. Filters and resonators, signal and CV generators. Ah, VCO. Let's see what he does for his VCO. Schematics. Let's take a look here. Okay. All right, so this transistor pair is part of a voltage to current conversion circuitry that has an exponential characteristic. We'll look at that in a later lecture. I've just taken this for granted so far. Let's see. Oh, this is clearly the integration cap for a sawtooth VCO. What's interesting about this design is that unlike the electronotes design that we found in Hal Chamberlain's book, the capacitor isn't part of the feedback loop of an op amp. It's just sort of dangling here. And then we have U6B here that's serving as a voltage buffer for the sawtooth output. Here's a 311 doing some comparator duties. There's a lot of attention here on making a solid 5 volts here. And Q1 is acting as the switch. And during the reset, it shorts to this 5 volts. So I think like with the Moog Werkstatt design, this starts at 5 volts and then goes down to 0. I would want to think about that more before declaring it the truth. And the Werkstatt uses a CMOS switch instead of a JFET here. Let's see. Okay, so... A sawtooth is coming out of here, probably gets level shifted and scaled by UA6, and then it's inverted here. Why is he doing that? You could probably take a sawtooth output directly here. I don't know. Maybe there's some particular reason he wants to have the sawtooth going a particular direction. Anyway, this also feeds this U6C, which is a TLO74 op amp. So this isn't a specialized comparator. It's just a garden variety op amp. So let's see, the sawtooth is being compared to this voltage at pin 10. And if we scroll down a bit here, ah, so you can control the pulse width by a pot. So here's minus 15 volts, plus 15 volts. Oh, and let's see, it doesn't seem to be marked on here what the value of the pot is. So that's probably marked on a bill of material somewhere. Anyway, if you knew what the value of the pot was, you can figure out what voltage ranges you could get at the plus terminal by turning the pot here. We also have an external control voltage input that you can jack in here. Interestingly, this is a passive mixing structure. So if you just leave this disconnected and then plug a signal into here, but just set that to zero volts, that should change the voltage here a little bit because you would then have 180K in parallel with 470K instead of just the 470K there, but it's close enough for rock and roll probably. So let's see what happens at the output. What kind of pulse wave do we get? It looks like the circuit was mostly designed to work with plus minus 15 volt supplies, but it looks like you could also build a variation with some tweaks that uses plus minus 12 volts instead of 15 volts. So the 15 volts would be like an MOTM standard, and the 12 volts would be more like a Eurorack standard. 
And in case you're wondering, because I thought it would be fun, I hadn't really looked at this circuit before. I thought it would be fun to check one out and tackle it spontaneously. So I've pulled up Octave here. Now, if we're running off of 12-volt supplies, remember that the TL07X and TL08X series can't actually have the output swing all the way to the supply rails in either direction. There are some op amps that can swing all the way to the negative rail, but not all the way to the positive rail. And there are some special op amps called rail-to-rail -rail op amps that can swing all the way to both the negative and positive rails, but the TLO whatevers aren't any of that. They can probably swing to something around within, say, 1.5 volts of the power rail. So let's take 10.5 and multiply it by 4.7 divided by, let's say I don't really need this parenthesis here, 4.7 plus 10. Notice I'm not putting in E3, 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 since that would cancel anyway. Also, in thinking about replacing this whole thing with a Thevenin equivalent, I'm imagining that I'm sensing the voltage with some sort of perfect infinite impedance voltage measurement device, so I don't have to worry about voltage dropping across the 1K resistor. So let's see. If we use a 12-volt supply, that would make the output here swing between somewhere between minus 3.36 and plus 3.36 volts. Of course, that 1.5 will vary a little bit depending on kind of what's happening with the op amp. That's just a rule of thumb. What if we used 15 volt supplies? Okay, so if I subtract 1.5, that's 13.5. I do the same voltage divider here. That gives me plus or minus 4.3 volts at this output. Let's see, what is the output impedance here? Okay, well then I would have to have that 1K. If I'm thinking about this ob amp as being a perfect voltage source, it has zero output impedance. So essentially what I have here is I would have 10K to ground because I'm thinking about that voltage source as being perfect when calculating the output resistance here. Let's see, so what's 10K in parallel with 4.7K? So that will leave me with 3.1973K. Okay, so it's whatever that is plus one. So that's like a 4.2K output resistance. So, if you would like to build your own USynth VCO or one of his other modules, there's a wealth of information here, including circuit board designs, which you can try to fabricate in a variety of different ways. Or, if you look around a bit, it seems that there are some vendors out there that say they'll sell you some USynth PCBs, so you could check those out.